I'd like to begin um, with two quotes, if I can get my uh, phone to work. Um, these are two of my favorite quotes. One is from a man named Towler. Johannes Towler was a student of Meister Eckhart back in the 13th century. And this is what he writes about being home. Beyond this, we are led into another heaven, which is the divine essence itself, where we lose ourselves so completely that no trace of ourself remains. What happens to us there, what we experience and enjoy, no mind can ever experience, conceive, or understand. Indeed, how could the mind ever grasp such a thing? For so submerged are we now into this divine ground that we know nothing, feel nothing, understand nothing but God alone in God's simple, pure, and undisguised unity. Let me do that once again. I think it deserves reading about 10 or 20 times, actually. Beyond this, we are led into another heaven, which is the divine essence itself, where we lose ourselves so completely that no trace of ourself remains. What happens to us here, what we experience and enjoy, no mind can ever grasp, experience, conceive, or understand indeed. How could the mind ever grasp such a thing? For so submerged are we now into the divine ground that we know nothing, feel nothing, understand nothing, but God alone in God's pure and undisguised unity. And there are two quotes that I have loved over the years. Buddha was a very cagey person because when he was asked to speak directly, to name what it is that he had discovered, he was loath to talk about it directly because he feared that the mind of the listener would turn it into another object. But on two instances, he speaks, I think, very admirably to what it is that we discover when we come home. So here's Buddha in two instances describing his experience. There is this that is beyond the entire field of matter and the entire field of mind that is neither of this world nor another nor both, neither moon nor sun. This I call neither arising nor passing away, nor abiding, neither dying nor rebirth. It is without support, without development, without foundation. This I call the unborn, the unbecome, the uncreated, the unconditioned, this I call the end of suffering. Do not think that this is an empty or void state. There is this that is without a distinguishing mark, infinite and shining everywhere, untouched by the material elements and not subject to any power. Here it is that conditioned consciousness ceases to be. This I call the end of suffering. I love Buddha because I think of him as the unkola. It says it's unbecome, it's unborn, it's unthis, it's unthat. And I think it's a, a, a beautiful way of speaking directly to what it is as we come home. It's ineffable, it's not something we can name, it's not something we can truly talk about. 
So when I was thinking of my title, being home, I thought home was too much. And then I thought being is too much. So I think I'll just keep quiet. or not. <laughs> or maybe. <laughs> I was speaking last night when I first encountered yoga in my first yoga class in 1970 when I was at the Integral Yoga Institute. And at the end of the class, the teacher taught a rudimentary yoga nidra. <coughs> and I left the class feeling like I had come home. There was a moment where there was no separation either inside of myself, and I felt no separation with anything that I was gazing at. While that experience was an experience and it lasted some days and then vanished, it left with me, within me a tremendous hunger to both understand what had happened and what was this process that I had just engaged in the class, which led me into a deep search for this sense of coming home. I was very fortunate in a very short time to meet a woman who had just arrived from the Far East who would become my mentor both in my studies of psychology but also in my understanding of what it is to come home. And it's with her guidance on many occasions, that same understanding took hold again. And then as quickly as it had come, it would leave again. And it was in 1984, I met my teacher, Jean Klein. And he said an interesting thing in our first meeting, knowing what he was, uh, what I was interested in. He said to me, almost his exact words, your longing and your searching has brought you here. Now your longing and your searching is going to be taking you away. It took me another four years to begin to understand what he was saying in those simple words. But what I came to understand is my searching was actually taking me away from being home. And through his help and guidance, I really began to understand what it truly means to be home. I was mentioning last night, I gave two presentations today. Some of you were there, some of you weren't. Um, on this quality of being, I think it's apt that we're called human beings and not human doings. But the secret is in there that's often called an open secret of being. Because when I'm in audiences and I ask people, um, one, do you understand the quality of being? Many people don't. And those who do, when I ask, how much of your day do you spend nourishing being? And I'm always shocked at how few people who do understand being spend little precious time each day nourishing it. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time first just mining this aspect of being.
So forgive me if, if you've been with me twice already today. This is a third time. I'll take you through it. I'll go through it fairly simplistically tonight, and if you're interested in more depth with it, catch me walking on the beach and I'll take time with you. But what's it like when you're between two doings? In meditation, we might say it's that moment when we're between two thoughts. Or at the end of the exhalation, when the physical breath has died away, and then there's an energetic component to the breath, and that dies away. And all of a sudden, we're not just in a silence, we're in a stillness that is beyond silence. We might say we're in the absence of the absence. That's the negative way. Or we might say we are being our very presence of being in that moment. So what's it like if we could all settle back for a moment in just the ease of being? In the teachings that I work with, which come out of the Kashmir non-dual approach, in the Shiva Sutras, there's a beautiful map of meditation that's expounded. And halfway up the map, there are five inquiries. They call them the Kanchukas. There are five inquiries on being. And so I'd love to just take you through them just briefly. And I hope there's something in here that you may contemplate later in your own meditation. But when we're just being, notice as you're being here in this moment, in being, we've let go of the past. And in being, as I was talking about last night, when Molly and I were sharing up here, if we were to look at you in an MRI, your default network basically begins to turn off. Your thinking mind begins to go quiet. You step out of your conditioning. You step out of your autobiographical sense of self. And you step out of time and space. So as you're just being, one of the questions I'd love you to contemplate is how would you describe as being where your location is? Where's the location of being? How would you describe the felt sense of it both in your body somatically its location, where it takes you in your body when you're just being. And where we might ask, is its most innermost center or core, and where is its most outer periphery? When I was sharing this in a homeless shelter many years ago, in first teaching this, which I love to do, because I'd, I'd like to bring people home immediately, not as some goal that's out there, but in the immediacy of the moment. This woman who had been homeless for many years and was now working her way back into the mainstream life, when I asked for her reflection on where do you feel yourself when you're just being? How would you describe your location? And she said a most beautiful thing. She said, I feel this sense of presence that's undeniable, yet I also feel myself everywhere and nowhere specific. I feel myself everywhere and nowhere specific, yet as an undeniable presence. 
take that for a moment as you settle into being and just see if that might ring true for you. I feel myself as an undeniable presence And yet I feel myself everywhere and nowhere specific. What I find for myself in being is I move out of my thinking mind down into my heart. That brings a sense of well-being And it feels like it opens a field that as I feel into it, it melts away the boundaries of my body. And as far as I go out, it feels like I'm already there meeting myself. I feel myself everywhere and nowhere specific. There's a kind of a story in here. Maybe you'll find it humorful. I certainly did. You know, in my early years, there were, there were struggles I had with Great Depression. And there was a period in my middle or late teens, early adulthood, where, where there was a certain amount of paranoia, actually, that was present. I was scared all the time. And when I came home... <coughs> And I really did feel myself everywhere. I realized I did have the right to be paranoid because I was everywhere looking at myself from everywhere. And I was everywhere looking at, so I was always being seen. I don't know if that's funny, but it was funny to me at the time. It was a realization that we are in a, respect everywhere, always seeing ourself. There's no way possibly that we can lie and tell an untruth. We're always knowing at some level what we're doing. We're always being seen by ourself. So as we come back to being, and we feel this everywherenessness, and I, and I hope you're trying this on as I'm speaking. As you settle into being, notice what happens to the thinking mind. If you're really settling into being, it's a felt sense, it's a quality we might say close to sensation. And as we settle into being, the thinking mind grows quieter and quieter and quieter. And with the thinking mind goes time. So in that same homeless shelter, as people were sitting in this quality of being, and I asked the audience, as I'm asking you, So what's your relationship to time when you're just being? And I think the most adequate response I've ever heard was one one of the fellows, one of the homeless fellows, he said, who cares? In a moment when we're in being, when we really settle into it, we find ourselves outside of time. As thought drops, so does time, because time is thought and thought is time. They go together. Without one, you can't have the other. And then there's a third question that I found very instrumental in working with people with trauma. When you're just being, and again, speaking from being, if you're being and you're speaking to answer this question, when you're being as being, do you lack for anything? 
Do you need anything that would make you as being any more perfect than you already are? Can you feel how as being there's a sense of beyond lack, beyond need? We're not denying the body's need for food, shelter, clothing, safety. But if we put that aside for a moment and we really come back to just the felt sense, your first-hand experience of being, you may discover there's something about you that feels no sense of lack, no sense of need or want. You are outside of lack. In a way, you're resting in something that feels perfect, just as it is. And as we settle into being, we find something that we all know. It's very familiar. We don't need a book. Excuse me, we don't need a teacher. And we don't need a teaching. Pragmatically, I think we do need the books and I think we do need the teachings and we do need the teacher because there are guides who have traveled this before us and can help us realize this for ourselves. But in a way, you become your own teacher, you become your own teaching, and you become your own book that you're reading as being. So as being is being unfamiliar or is it something that you've always known, and as you settle into it, might it bring a feeling of feeling complete? I don't need anything in addition to what I am as being when I'm just resting as being. And the final kanchuka inquiry here, kanchuka means a sheath, by the way, that we identify, we get lost in. So I'm taking away the sheaths one by one that we I get identified with. The final inquiry in this five inquiries is, is there anything that being needs in terms of doing? Or can you readily experience how you could be engaged in work, play, eating, talking, interacting in any kind of way, and being could be accompanying it. It doesn't need a quality of doing to get being. Being is already home in a way. It's already ours. We're already here in being. Yet, if we don't understand it and nourish it, we might not understand this. So, let's look at the five questions, what they're revealing about something about ourself. We're an undeniable presence that's spacious, unbounded, unlocalized, unbecome, unconditioned. We're outside of time and space. We're perfect just as we are. We're complete and we're whole. So one of the things I, I'm hoping I'll leave with you tonight is something very practical, which is while we're meditating and all through the day, might we keep nourishing and coming across these five different aspects of ourself, feeling our spacious unboundedness, our timelessness, where to even say now is too much, something about us that is perfect, complete, and whole. Wouldn't this be an incredible starting place for the healing journey as a yoga therapist to introduce someone who has trauma or has undue stress in their life or is going through cancer treatment or is struggling with some serious circumstance in their life 
where to some degree or another they feel something's wrong, something's broken, something needs to be fixed or changed. I was talking a little bit at last night, but if we look at how we're genetically engineered, the body, the mind, the senses, and this interesting aspect of the ego, the self, the sense of self as separate, which comes online for all of us around 18 months of age, that gives us a sense of separation. When I think of the body, the senses, the mind working in concert with this interesting genetically engineered thought, I, which uh, scientists say didn't exist say 125,000 years ago, it's relatively new on the scene, we might say. And imagine where this sense of I or ego may be in another 125,000 years when it's maybe uh, in its early adolescence, we might say. What is its function? What is its role? Why do we have this sense of self? And for me, what I see is the body, the mind, the senses, and the sense of I-ness help create a sense of border and boundaries where, in fact, there are none. If we look at a tree from a quantum physicist's view, there's just space. If we look at it from an energetic perspective, there's just vibration. But somehow we're able to assemble it into a tree we're able to touch it, feel it as solid and separate. And that's what our body, mind, senses, and ego are designed to do, create this sense of border, boundary, and separation. Yet as we land in being, my sense is it opens us to a seventh sense. It awakens a seventh sense in us that knows no separation, no boundary, no time, no space, doesn't lack and doesn't need anything at all. It's perfect just as it is. And it knows no sense of separation. It's interesting for most people in the world, they're meeting each other face to face. But what if you met the person you're meeting being to being? There'd still be face to face, but being, which knows no boundary, would be meeting being, which knows no boundary, which in a way, then we're just meeting ourself at a non-separate level. Then paradoxically, we could be experiencing both separation, because that's what our eyes would be seeing. Somebody over there with hair, and nobody over here with hair, or very little someone that looks very different, so border, boundary, separation, and yet with that seventh sense awake, we don't see other. We only sense ourself as an underlying essence, that that over there is spacious, timeless, without lack, perfect and whole, just as it is, just as we are, and then it is non-separation meeting non-separation at a very visceral level. I'm not talking intellectually here. I'm talking at a very visceral, somatic, felt sense. From being, and there are exercises in some of the Advaitic uh, texts that come out of the Kashmir tradition, the Vijnana Bhairav is 112 ways to know yourself as God, and some of the ways are gazing at a tree, gazing at a mountain, gazing at another human being, until all sense of boundary dissolves and you realize you're just meeting yourself in another form. And a long time occurred to me as I sat in being for long periods of time that from the perspective of being, we can celebrate difference because that's what the eyes and the senses do. We do see somebody else over there who holds different views, different opinions, different ideas, different creativity than we do. 
So we can separate, we can celebrate difference. We could even celebrate at times that we conflict on how we feel. But it's impossible to do war if you're resting as being and meeting everything else as an incarnation of being. Why? It doesn't make sense to go to war with yourself. It does make sense to celebrate some differences, but we can't do war. So the pragmatical aspect of being is to take time as we're going through our day. And one of the best times is when we first wake up in the morning. Tomorrow morning, as your body is beginning to awaken, and just enough self-awareness reassembles. My advice, don't move a muscle. Take the moment and feel how this quality of being is here and has been with you all night long. If you're awakening from a dream, feel back and notice five seconds, 10 seconds, a minute into the dream, how the dream material was emerging, but the feeling of being was there in the background. And now as self-awareness is arising and the world is beginning to reappear because you're waking up, how being is in a way prior to the world arising. The world, in a way, arises out of being. And then to nourish that as you're lying in bed, as I will tomorrow morning, for a while, and then to take it with you as you get up and go into your day, and then all day long, continue to nourish it. Our job initially is really remembering being remembering it while we're walking, while we're eating, while we're conversing, in all of our activities all day long. In the early 70s, when I was really understanding this, I bought one of those new Timex watches that put on an hour chime, and every hour it would go off as a way of remembering it to me. And then I would reassert that feeling of being and then go about my day because I noticed because of conditioning, I wasn't oriented to remembering it. So I would use every kind of aid that I could to remember. There does come a time, and I like to say it this way, when you're being and the switch goes on and you can really feel the sense of being, your spacious, timeless perfection of complete wholeness, and you're just resting in it. And while you are, somebody gets inside that light switch, they solder all the wires together, and now it won't turn off. Now there's a switch over. You're no longer remembering being. You're realizing that being is remembering you. And I think that that's really the truth right now. Being is constantly trying to remember you, but we go diversion into thoughts, into emotions, into the different needs or cravings that we have. And so the teachings of meditation and yoga are designed in a way to calm the mind down, calm the wants and the needs down enough so that we can really give our undivided attention to this quality of being. In the second sutra of Patanjali, he says, yoga chitvritti narodaha. And to me, naroda is the key word here. And often it's translated as a verb, to still or to stop. Yogash, yoga, chitvritti, the waves of the mind, naroda. When the yoga is, when the thought waves are stilled or stopped. But what happens if we take naroda as a noun, not a verb? 
or as a noun and a verb in the sutra. Then the sutra might read very differently. Yoga is when you know yourself as that stillness, as that quality of beingness, whether the mind is in movement or is completely still. I'm aware initially it might be helpful to still the mind so that we can feel this underlying essence of being that is, in a way, taking us home. But I, a long time, came to realize that the thinking mind is designed to think. And you can keep that sucker quiet for a few minutes, maybe, maybe for an hour or two, but it's designed to think. So if yoga is predicated on the mind being still, then yoga is not going to be happening very often, I don't think. But if we understand this deeper quality of stillness or beingness, then we can see how the thinking mind can be present and we know ourselves as that non-separate essence of being. I hope that makes sense. I'm hoping I'm not doing too much discredit to the Sanskrit. But one of my teachers said of Sanskrit that I could translate Naroda both as a verb and a noun because of the language Sanskrit. Let's look at being the other way because the Kanchukas mean covering, something we get identified with. So I just kind of gave the... Um, transcendent view of the Kanchukas, when we leave behind our sense of being boundaried and bordered as a separate skin-bodied self, and we realize ourself as spacious, and where we step out of time, being bound by time, and we step out of need or lack, and we realize something about us is okay just as we are, and something about us is complete and whole. And we open into a whole new domain. And there is something beyond being, which I want to talk about. But for the moment, say, we're fully flush as being. Spacious, timeless, perfect, complete, and whole. And I think it's very important during meditation at times to just feel these different aspects about ourself. But let's look at trauma. So say you're immersed in being and you have this awake quality of non-separation. Your eyes still perceive border and boundary, but something about you doesn't know separation anymore. You've awoken to this deep understanding. And you're going along and, God forbid, some awful thing happens. If you're at war, an explosion happens. If you're at home, your best friend dies, or you get a terrible illness, or someone around you has a terrible illness and you find yourself caretaking, and you begin to feel the stress of it. But you've got a certain quality of resiliency about you, and you bounce back. As my friend Linda Graham, some of you have met her, talks about in her book, Bouncing Back. You have this resiliency that you're able to move through the trauma, the difficult circumstance, bounce back into that feeling of being. But what happens as you're starting to bounce back, another explosion goes off, or another compounding of the illness, or some other stress in your life. And just as you're starting to bounce back from that, you get hit again, and then hit again, and then get a hit again. And people who've been abused all their life have basically suffered hit after hit after hit, and just as they're starting to recover, they get hit again. What begins to happen now, we see, is the whole system starts to go out of whack. It gets dysregulated by the stress or the trauma. And I'm aware that trauma can be as benign as you're working in an office and the phone keeps ringing and you have no time off and you have to keep answering emails, and that stress builds over time. And what's going to start to happen over time if you don't bounce back, if you don't come to Shivananda Ashram and take a few weeks off every year to yourself, you're going to start to become dysregulated. 
So what are, what are happening when you're dysregulated in trauma? Well, the back of your brain, which controls and regulates all of your unconscious forces like digesting food, the kind of nutrition you look for, uh, how you breathe, these kind of basic heart rate variability, they all start to go out of whack. And the vagus nerve gets struck in your body and that enervates every organ in your body and you'll start to feel a visceral feeling that something's not right. You know, when you fall in love and then one day your lover leaves you and you're suffering, I'm sure none of you have that, but if you have, you feel awful, don't you? Your stomach aches, your heart aches, you can't sleep. No matter how you think, you can't get your thought off the beloved. And why is it? It's because your vagus nerve system, which regulates all your organs, has completely dysregulated. And that heartache is the vagus nerve, that stomach ache is the vagus nerve, the the yearning that you're feeling is coming from your vagus nerve. And somebody who has trauma gets dysregulated and they start to feel more and more that something's wrong and something's not right. So take it in any level that you've experienced it in your life when you've begun to feel that something's not right or something is off about your system. By the way, the other thing that happens in trauma is the whole front cortex of the brain becomes dysregulated. It breaks apart your ability to have social relationships. You start to feel disconnected both within, through that dysregulation of your base brain, and without, through the dysregulation of your frontal brain. Your, your relationships get all wacky, and you start to feel disconnected and a, and a sense of being broken in some way. So say you're in some kind of stress and distress like this. What's the first thing as a human being we start to do? Well, we start to try to do something. What can I do to make this go away? Is there something I can engage, some action I can do? And say you look all around you and you try all sorts of doings, but somehow that doesn't work. So what's the next thing you do? Maybe I could find a good book, a teacher, a mentor, a psychotherapist who could really help me understand this that feels dysregulated into me. But say you go to the wrong therapist and you pick up the wrong book, or even if you pick up the right book, it looks in Greek to you, and the teacher is saying all these wonderful things, but you just can't understand it, and you still feel dysregulated. So what's the next thing we as human beings tend to do? Maybe I need a new job, maybe I need a new car, maybe a new dog, maybe I need to exchange my spouse for a new one. There's something that I'm lacking, if I could only fill it in, maybe this awful feeling inside of me would go away. Maybe I need to drink more, self-regulate myself through drugs or alcohol or sex. And we try it and it doesn't work, does it? So what are the last two things we want? We want more time and more space. If only I had more time, I could figure this out. And if I could only get a little bit more space in my life, I could figure this out. So we've become a doer and a knower and a seeker who needs more time and more space. And we call that a normal human being. Someone who feels a sense of lack who's in time, in space, who's searching all, f all over the place for knowledge of some kind, and is doing, 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 trying to feel better. Then one day, you happen to be at Shivananda Ashram, and you're listening to one of the teachers expound, and they may talk about this quality of being, and all of a sudden you begin to feel something in you that's outside of space, spacious and open, unboundary, outside of time, complete, perfect, and whole. 
and all of a sudden you come back home. And this is why I like giving this in homeless shelters, in VA centers, when I work with human trafficking, when I work with children, young adults. I want them to feel this sense of being home because from being home, now we can perhaps look at what's dysregulated, what does need fixing, what may need to be changing, but we're very clear. I am okay. I am spacious, unboundaried, timeless, perfect, complete, and whole. That's who I am. My body, man, it may be a mess. My mind and my thoughts are all screwy, and I need help at that level with my body, my senses, and mind. But now I know that I'm not just my body, my senses, and mind. I'm this quality of being. Now we have real ground from which to move into healing. But it's not predicated on me being fixed. I already know I'm okay. It's predicated on my body and my mind needs some help. It's a beautiful way to start the healing journey. But if I may, and I've got a few more minutes, I get to go until 9.45. What if you're cooking in being? And day after day, you're walking around with this quality of being, and you're noticing you can have thoughts, you can have emotions, you can be in deep conversation or in deep meditation, and the feeling of being doesn't change. It's constant, familiar, always the same, and always fresh. You know, as a Hatha yoga teacher, when I first learned to teach Hatha yoga, I learned about the poses and how the foot should be turned this way and the body should be oriented this way. And I learned magnificent techniques for teaching asana. And I also learned incredible techniques for teaching medi uh, pranayama. But what I found as a teacher, when I only learned technique, I became bored after a while, and I would search out a new teaching. And over 20 some odd years, I went from teacher and teaching to teacher and teaching, getting new technique and accumulating new ways of teaching asana and teaching pranayama. But invariably, at the end of the day, I would start to feel that sense of boredom again until I met Jean. And actually, it started when I was in India with TKV Desikachar and studying uh, with him privately. It began there, and then it really took off when I met Jean. My teacher, Jean, had been in India in the 50s and had studied actually with T. Krishnamacharya in the early 1950s, with, um, who was uh, Desikachar's father. And when I first met Jean and saw him teaching, I went up to him right away and I said, have you ever studied with Krishnamacharya? And he said, yeah, because I could see something in his yoga was very much like what I had been learning from Krishnamacharya's son, Desikachar. But when Jean really helped me open into being as a yoga teacher, what I found was something that's always fresh, always new, always the same, always recognizable, and that if I could bring the quality of being into teaching asana, from that moment on, it never became boring. It was always fresh, because I was teaching out of being, not a technique, but being itself. And so I started teaching these five inquiries during asana, during pranayama, during meditation, introducing people to this quality of being. And I found that it really kept me fresh, brand new in each moment. Because being, if we really see it and feel it, it's always new, it's always fresh. But if we look at being, it's like 
you enter into the first, I call it the first portal of being home. It's a magnificent discovery to rest in being and to feel this that's whole about ourself. But I came to understand that being itself is an arising in a vaster openness of awareness. And I realized that being, in a way, was a stepping stone to awareness. Because as we feel into being awareness, we feel something vaster in which being, in a way, arises and subsides. And as I probed into awareness with the help of my teacher, there came this portal that Towler introduces us to, something that takes us even beyond awareness into what I would call our real homecoming. But in this moment of true homecoming, all sense of separation and all sense of self disappears. We go somewhere where I is not. In being, and even in awareness, there's a quality of self-awareness where we can say, I'm being, I'm awareness. But where we go in deep meditation at times is beyond even this. So let me read Towler's remark once again, because I think he really says it so admirably. Listen again. Beyond this. So he, he is saying beyond this self-awareness, this awareness of a sense of self that can say, I'm awareness or I'm being. Beyond this, we are led into another, which is the divine itself, where we lose ourself so completely that no trace of ourself remains. What happens to us there, what we experience and enjoy, no mind, no self can ever experience, conceive, or understand indeed. How could the mind ever grasp such a thing? For so submerged are we now, so absorbed into the divine that we know nothing, feel nothing, understand nothing but God alone in God's pure, simple, and undisguised unity. In deep meditation, there's a complete absorption of all sense of self, so there's nobody in there saying, oh, look, there's no self here. If you were, you wouldn't be absorbed. In that disillusion of a sense of self, we return home. And there's a moment as self-awareness begins to come back and reassemble itself. Like a truck or a car that has a wind that it carries behind it. As self-awareness begins to emerge, it brings with it the fragrance of where we just were, where I is not. And I liken then meditation as becoming color fast. In deep meditation and deep absorption, we go back home. And then as enough of self, we might say self-awareness reemerges, we come back with that perfume and we take it into our daily life but life is such that like the sun, it bleaches out that fragrance and we lose it again. We go back into meditation, we go back home, we come back with that fragrance and we do that over and over and over again until one day we come out color fast. That fragrance permeates us all day long and the sun, circumstances of life, don't bleach it out, don't disrupt it that sense of being and awareness and the fragrance of that homecoming permeates our life. 
So in leaving this tonight, this subject, I hope and I encourage you to spend time nourishing being. It's a portal, like a stepping stone into a deeper vastness of awareness. That when we're just sitting in meditation in deep quality of being awareness, we may see the subtle movements of self-awareness, striving, looking for some goal. And as Jean told me, your striving now, your searching is taking you away. In that moment of deep meditation, we need to see that all striving, all trying to achieve, all search is now taking us away. And as Heidegger said, we need to learn how to wait here without waiting without striving. And in seeing striving, seeing the quality of self-awareness that keeps pulling us into a sense of separation, in seeing that, it's the possibility of setting it free. And in that moment, I liken it to falling asleep at night. None of us know how to fall asleep, do we? I turn out the lights, I say my good night, I do a day's review, I open to being and awareness, and now I'm sitting there basically saying, take me, I'm ready. But I don't know how to fall asleep, I'm just there waiting without waiting. And I trust that sleep will take me, which it does, and in the morning I awaken in that quality of being and self-awareness reassembles itself. In that moment of deep meditation, it's a, it's a moment where we truly say to ourselves, I'm ready, take me. And from my perspective, it is grace then that comes and takes us. The work we've done has brought us to that moment when we're standing at the cliff. And grace very kindly comes up from behind us and pushes us over the cliff, and we're taken. And in a way, meditation then is the end of seeking, is the end of striving, where we're just sitting there over and over, waiting, without waiting. And all of a sudden, we're taken and coming back with that fragrance. And the caution I like to give is, as you return from deep meditation, deep absorption, Conditioning may have you habitually saying to yourself, oh, I just fell asleep again. Be careful. Is it that you just fell asleep? Or is it that you were taken, all sense of self dissolved, and now that sense of self is starting to reassemble, and it's bringing back the fragrance of where you just were, where you're not. And if you go too quickly into your conditioned mind, you may miss that fragrance. So I hope we all have a homecoming tonight. And I'll see you in the morning. <laughs>